I can send you a link for that. Thank you. Yeah. We just want to double check. It may come to my account, but let's double back it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. So it is, um, yeah, it looks like it is now recording. So, well, thanks so much for having me, you guys. Um, wanted to talk about uh, several things today. We'll uh, go into uh, a discussion of a few different topics. Um, first of all, I wanted to discuss a little bit about um, a, a couple of definitions and chromosomal inheritance and how that kind of works a little bit, just to kind of some nuts and bolts about things, just to, to uh, give you an idea as to why or how this testing might, might help or how it works. Um, then we're going to talk specifically about a type of inheritance known as recessive inheritance, because that is really important for discussing uh, four of the diseases that we'll talk about today um, that we have genetic testing available for in the Boykin Spaniel. These are all recessive diseases, and so that's why we'll discuss that there. Um, and then we have, uh, we'll briefly discuss uh, dominant inheritance as well, and then we'll move on to this discussion about chondrodystrophy and intervertebral disc disease, which the risk factor for that is inherited in what we call a dominant fashion, which means that you only need one copy of that mutation in order to actually uh, show uh, an increased risk of that, that uh, condition. So we'll go into that. Uh, first of all, a few definitions. Um, a lot of people uh, are familiar with the word mutation. Um, it, it's essentially just an alteration in the DNA that affects gene function. Um, it's more commonly being referred to as variant or genetic variant nowadays. But um, And then this change can potentially result in a disease or trait. It doesn't always have to. Sometimes it doesn't change anything at all in the dog. In other cases, it may be completely uh, in, uh, incompatible with life. So it just kind of depends on where the location of that mutation occurs in the genome. Um, one of the uh, one version or one copy of the gene is is referred to as an allele, and there are different versions of the gene based upon the mutations that each uh, that have occurred in each of those genes. And so there's some genetic diversity that's that's involved in each gene, and and each allele is a different copy or version of the gene. And we would inherit that, or a dog would inherit that from a single parent, um, and then inherit the and a, potentially a different allele from the other parent. In some cases, it might be the exact same allele um, or a same copy of the the gene. The genotype is uh, what we refer to as the combination of both of these alleles. And so a dog's combination at any specific location in the genome. So uh, for a particular gene, for example, um, if uh, the genotype is the combination of both of those, and it's often designated with a very particular um, uh, nomenclature. Um, each lab's a little bit different in how they show this, but, um, but we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Then we have phenotype. And so the genotype is actually the genetics behind uh, a particular trait or disease. And then the phenotype is actually what happens. So the phenotype is a clinical or physical presentation of the affected gene. There can be uh, situations where uh, dogs can be what we call asymptomatic carriers. Um, this is true in recessive diseases or traits where they inherit one copy of the mutation from one parent, but it, that is not enough to actually give them the trait or the disease. Um, and so they may not show that actual phenotype. Um, but, uh, but they could still produce dogs with that trait or disease if they happen to be bred with a dog uh, that also has that same mutation. And then we have heterozygous and homozygous. And these are just uh, different ways of, of discussing the actual alleles or the different versions of the gene that a particular individual has inherited. <laughs> Um, if, if someone got two exact copies of the same gene, then we refer to that as being homozygous. Um, and if they get two different copies of the gene, then that would be heterozygous. And so they would have different versions or alleles there. When we look at the genome as a whole, in dogs, we have 39 pairs of chromosomes in dogs. In humans, it's 23 pairs. Um, but basically, they are uh, sections of DNA that include genes on them. And, um, and each parent passes on one copy of each chromosome to every uh, offspring. So in this case, we have uh, 38 pairs of what we refer to as autosomes, which are the chromosomes which do not dictate the sex of the dog. And then we have one, chromosome, one pair of chromosomes down here, which are the sex chromosomes, which help play a role in determining the sex uh, or gender of the dog. Um, and, and as an analogy, if one dog's entire genome is a book, then we can think about that chromosomes are kind of like the pages in the book. They're going to contain some vital information there um, in, in that. And then genes on that, that page 
or excuse me, genes would be like paragraphs on those pages. And so each paragraph is going to have kind of a different idea or a different concept. Each gene is going to actually be a blueprint for a different protein um, in the body. And then lastly, uh, nucleotides are like the letters on the page. And nucleotides are the small molecules that make up DNA and end up uh, being the foundation for what creates these chromosomes that we're seeing here. When we're looking then at excuse me, at, at the population as a whole, we have to think if, if we're using the same analogy of a book, if we're looking at the whole population genome, it would be similar to a large library where there are going to be books there that are going to be very similar to each other, maybe on the same subject, all of these things. But in actuality, there's going to be differences between each of these books to some degree. And when we're thinking about the genetic population as a whole, um, when it comes to genetics, the more diverse that library is, or the most more diverse that genome is, is, is overall typically better for the breed as a whole. And when we talk about IVDD later, we'll be discussing um, the importance of keeping genetic diversity high within the breed. If we're going to try to eliminate the mutation associated with IVDD, there are some important factors to discuss. When we, when we talk specifically about the genetic molecules, um, there are four specific molecules that make up uh, the entire strand of DNA. There's four different building blocks that are pieced together to create uh, DNA, which then will form these chromosomes. And they're uh, all marked by these different letters, A, C, G, and T, which stand for the, the actual name of the nucleotides that are placed there, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. And dogs have about 2.5 billion base pairs or, or 2.5 billion pairs of these. Um, they line up uh, in the molecule in a very uh, death defined pattern. So G, the G always binds to C, the A always binds to T. And, and that property actually plays a really important role in maintaining um, uh, genetics across uh, bloodlines and, and into offspring. So as I mentioned, the genes uh, do serve as a blueprint for proteins. So essentially they are kind of the blueprint for everything that, that's made up in our body. Um, there's about 19,000 genes in dogs. So on average, and this would definitely be an average, um, about 490 genes per chromosome. Some chromosomes are gonna have a lot more than that. Some are gonna have a lot less than that. And mutation in the DNA code, uh, uh, mutations in the DNA code can alter the protein structure. And then in some cases that may result in disease or a particular trait. And um, I don't know if, it, uh, if anybody can let me know, can you see my arrow here on there? Is that, you see it? Okay, great. I see some head shaking. So great. Yes. Um, so when we're looking at this section right here, this is a very small subsection down here of a, of a section of DNA. And this is kind of how we go about developing our tests is that we look at this section of DNA. And if you notice right here, there's a little mark here that says G slash A. And this is actually a very specific mutation that, that goes in a normal dog having a G here. And, and the dogs that have this disease, which in this case is a type of progressive retinal atrophy, and it's this, uh, in this case, um, this one change right here in all of the, the 2.5 billion base pairs that this dog has, that one change can end up resulting in blindness. And so obviously you can see that, you know, it's, it's in some ways it's, it's almost a miracle that we ever turn out <laughs> normal. Um, but in this uh, case, looking here, this, this one single base pair change could actually have some very significant ramifications. So again, this is just kind of showing how these chromosomes uh, rearrange. Um, if we have a mom that's going to have two copy copies of chromosomes that she of chromosome one here that she got one from her mom and one from her dad, and randomly one of these is going to be passed on to the offspring as well. And so this is going to be true for all of the pairs. Um, and we would go down the line and take a look um, at all of those. And then when we get to the sex chromosomes, obviously that's going to help dictate the males really going to dictate uh, what the gender of the offspring may be because his sperm are either going to be male or female. They're either going to contain an X or a Y. And so when the offspring, when that comes together with the X chromosome from the female, um, then that would end up resulting in either a, a female or male. So going forward with that, um, we're going to talk a little bit here about a, a very particular and, and very important inheritance pattern that we see in a lot of uh, dogs that are in a lot of diseases that we test for, um, specifically uh, this recessive uh, pattern. And recessive diseases are those that a dog must inherit two copies of the associated genetic mutation. So it has to get one from each parent. Um, uh, in order to develop the disease. 
And dogs, as I mentioned earlier, dogs that have only a single copy of one of these mutations, they're considered asymptomatic carriers. We would never know that they actually had this mutation. We would never have any indication um, uh, in most, most of these true recessive diseases that they actually have it at all. And so this is where genetic testing can be really important because if we happen to breed two asymptomatic carriers together, we can get some affected dogs. And so by knowing whether that they are asymptomatic carriers will be very helpful in, de in determining which direction we wanna go with breeding. And as I mentioned, carriers or affected dogs um, that uh, they can produce affected puppies if they're bred with another dog that also has that same genetic mutation. So this, uh, I want to show kind of how, what we're trying to avoid here. So here's a situation where we have a dog that has uh, a pairing of dogs. Both of them are asymptomatic carriers for a particular disease. So that means that they have one copy of the normal gene. Um, then they also have one copy of the mutated gene and placing them in this category. And we've notated this here by the capital A being the normal copy of the gene and a lowercase a being the mutated copy of the gene. You might have seen something like this before in, in biology in high school or junior high with this Punnett square here where this is a tool that we use to, to determine how these specific alleles may be distributed to the offspring from the parents. And if we set up this little model here and then essentially pull in all of these letters. So we would uh, into these squares in their direction, we can kind of get an idea of what we would expect to see. Now, it is important to note that random selection or random chance also plays an important role in this, but this is going to be what we refer to as a statistical average, which is going to give us kind of the general uh, information that we would need to, to at least have an idea of what to expect in a litter. So in this particular case, we can see that uh, one out of every four puppies would likely end up as actually being clear, not having the disease in this case, if we're breeding two carriers together. Um, about two out of the four or about 50% of the dogs will actually be carriers because they've got one copy of the genetic mutation here. And then the remaining 25% would actually fall into this category of being affected because they're gonna end up with two copies of the genetic mutation. And then as I mentioned, in the case of the recessive diseases, those two copies are what are is required to produce an affected dog. And so this is not going to be an ideal situation for us. What we would prefer to see is a situation where we don't get any affected dogs. And so when we have a dog that's a carrier, this situation would be the more ideal way to consider breeding them. And in this particular case, we've got a carrier and then a normal dog. And if we use the same technique here with our Punnett square, we end up finding that about one out of, or two out of every four or 50% of the dogs would actually end up as with a normal genotype. And then roughly about 50% of the dogs would end up as being carriers of that particular mutation, but we would not expect any of the dogs to actually develop that disease. And so this is where this testing comes in very handy. Um, and with this information, you can work to, to prevent you know, these things from happening. And so that's our end goal with genetic testing is to try to get to the point where we can find these carriers and then breed them to a clear dog to prevent producing any affected dogs. The first disease that is on our list at paw print that we talk about is a disorder that's known as Collie eye anomaly um, and as something that's, that has been discovered in, in Boykins. Um, and it, it also goes by the name choroidal hypoplasia, but it's essentially a disorder of, of a particular part of the eye known as the choroid, which occurs, uh, it's, it's essentially a vascular layer of the, of the uh, eye uh, near the retina that plays a role in the distribution of, of nutrients um, and blood uh, oxygen to, to areas of the eye. And dogs that have collie eye anomaly have an underdeveloped choroid and, um, and can have some issues. I will say that the vast majority of cases of collie and eye anomaly in, in affected dogs. And again, since this is actually recessive, it would require two copies of the mutation to be inherited for a dog to develop this. So one from each parent. Um, and it has variable, what we call variable expressivity, which means that not every dog is going to show the same level of severity of this disease. Um, and in fact, in some cases that are very mild, which is, is the majority of cases, um, after about 12 weeks of age, it may not be possible to see that these dogs actually have collie eye anomaly after about 12 weeks. In those very mild cases, those dogs will not show obvious vision deficits. Uh, in most cases, but um, it, they may actually be seen on an eye exam, especially before 12 weeks, but in a little bit more significant cases after 12 weeks, they may actually be able to see on an eye exam as well. What happens is, is that there's some pigment that gets laid down in the retina right around this time period, and the pigment that gets laid in there will mask some of the changes that can be seen um, on eye exam typically. As I mentioned, it is more common to be mildly affected than severely affected, but 
uh, dogs can have a wide variety of different uh, clinical signs. As I mentioned, there's, there's going to be this underdevelopment of the choroid, and, and uh, that can result in, in a variety of different things, all the way up to actually having detached retinas and, and bleeding into the eye, um, in some cases having vision deficits or blindness. There can be some abnormalities um, to the optic disc, which is the location where the optic nerve actually enters the eye there. Um, all of these things are, are potentially possible and could end up resulting in vision deficits. Luckily, the vast majority Majority of these cases do tend to be relatively mild, um, but something that would be best to be avoided through selective breeding, if at all possible. Another condition that's, that's uh, talked about a lot in dogs, um, this is degenerative myelopathy. Um, it's it's uh, caused by a mutation in what we call the SOD1 gene. And this is a very close correlate to Lou Gehrig's disease. And many of you have probably known somebody with Lou Gehrig's disease, um, but it is actually one of the causes of Lou Gehrig's disease is, is uh, due to mutations in the exact same gene in people. Um, but it's a, a recessive disease that displays what we call incomplete penetrance. And that means that not every dog that inherits two copies of this specific genetic mutation will go on to develop disease, though a large number do. And we don't really fully understand exactly why some do and some don't, but there are probably some other factors. Um, there has been one genetic factor that's been implicated in the Pembroke Welsh Corgi as, as being uh, a factor that could increase the likelihood of these dogs actually developing clinical signs or developing it at an earlier age. But dogs that inherit two copies of this mutation, if they are going to develop signs, most commonly show their first clinical signs somewhere about six and 10 years of age. And the most common things that we see, especially in the beginning, would be um, issues with hind limb weakness. Um, quite commonly, dogs will, will have difficulty uh, standing up or, or trouble using stairs. Uh, a lot of times people will notice that they hear their dog's hind limbs dragging or their toenails dragging on the pavement when they're walking them. And after some of those initial signs are seen, um, it slowly progresses in its severity over a course of about six months to two years. Usually within two years, the dogs are unable to walk. Um, unfortunately, it, it progresses to the point that it goes to the front end of the dog. Um, and, and most people make very challenging decisions at that point about what they're going to do. Um, it's been discovered that dogs that, that develop more end-stage degenerative myelopathy usually develop um, incontinence and respiratory failure. And respiratory failure is a common cause of, of death in uh, people with Luke Gehrig's disease. And so that makes a lot of sense from this perspective that that, that is kind of the end stage. Again, obviously something that we would want to avoid in our dogs, even, even in cases you know, where we don't necessarily know how likely they may be to develop it, the only real way to prevent it um, would be to actually, um, uh, oops, let me see here. Um, the only way to actually develop it, uh, to prevent it, would be to prevent dogs from producing, uh, having two copies of the mutation. So that would be really helpful um, in, in order to prevent that. I think I ac actually have a question here. Let's see, I think it was something about CEA. Let's see. Uh, there was one question that says, um, when a dog develops glassy um, or almost like a mirror-like reflection in the eyes, is that a sign of, of CEA? And um, no, it's not. Um, I, I guess it depends on exactly what you're referring to. Typically when you have CEA, when a dog has CEA, um, you would not typically expect to see anything outwardly unless you had an obvious uh, retinal uh, detachment or some other issue that, that made itself uh, visible. Most of the time you're going to see most of these things from an eye examination. Um, there would be potentially some um, some other things that could be seen, but most of the time it's just going to be that or uh, the possibility of having some vision deficits. Um, I do have another question here that's about um, in reference to IVDD and we'll be getting to that here in a little bit. And so I'll be referencing that question here in just a little while. Um, the third of the five diseases that we can test for in uh, the Boykin is uh, a condition known as exercise-induced collapse. This is also a neurological disease, and it, it ends up resulting in collapsing episodes most commonly associated with exercise. Um, what typically we would expect to see is in most cases, there's dogs that have, uh, that start to develop an uncoordinated gait, uh, usually about five to 20 minutes into exercise. Um, most commonly it starts in the hind end. I've actually seen some videos of Labradors um, with this condition where they'll actually just start dragging their hind legs and just keep trying to go um, to the point that they realize, well, I'm not really going anywhere. Um, and they may have some trouble. Uh, 
kind of kind of uh, navigating there for a short period of time. Um, many times the dogs may end up collapsing. Um, they typically will remain alert and and uh, conscious, and they're typically not in pain. But they um, it does take them some time to recover, and and usually about thirty minutes or so is what's necessary, or at least up to thirty minutes. In some cases, it may be a little bit shorter than that. These dogs look completely normal between episodes, and so um, they're they're really hard to detect otherwise. Um, there have been really severe uh, situations. Situations uh, confirmed in some dogs where they may have a really significant uh, confusion, loss of consciousness, and other issues that potentially could could pop up, um, and and even seizures have been reported. I think in most cases this tends to be more rare than than common. Um, most of the time it's just going to be these collapsing episodes. Obviously that can be really concerning though in situations where dogs, if they're going to be doing swimming or other potentially dangerous activities, if they happen to have a collapsing episode during that, obviously they could have a really bad uh, situation. Situation. And there have been some reported cases of dogs drowning um, when they have a, a situation like this occur during exercise. And so, again, this is also another recessive disease. Um, it does have variable expressivity. Um, not every dog shows uh, obvious clinical signs with this. Um, if they inherit two copies, kind of similar to DM, um, some dogs never end up showing any signs. There are some scientists that believe that if you just push these dogs hard enough, long enough, eventually they will show the clinical signs of disease. Um, but that's not always the case. In some cases, they, they may not uh, show it at all. And uh, the, the uh, next disease is something known as progressive retinal atrophy. Um, and this is a specific type of progressive retinal atrophy known as cone rod dystrophy 4. There are many other types of progressive retinal atrophy um, that occur in a variety of different breeds and caused by a variety of different genetic mutations. Um, this specific one that's been documented in the Boykin is uh, one that's, that's found in a, a gene that we often refer to as RPGRIP1. Um, and it is a, uh, again, a recessive disease with incomplete penetrance. So more similar to the DM and somewhat similar to EIC that dogs that have two copies of this, not every dog is going to develop the clinical disease. Uh, but what we uh, typically expect to see is, uh, in these dogs uh, is, is some onset in a very wide range, somewhere between one and 15 years of age has been reported in dogs. And the progression of the disease can also vary to some degree. Um, some dogs may progress to full blindness, other dogs, it may be a much slower progression and they may not quite reach uh, a complete blind state before the end of their life. Um, it, there's really a lot of variation from breed to breed or individual to individual um, on that. Uh, but again, another cause of, of blindness in dogs, it is due to a degeneration of the retina itself, specifically certain cells in the retina known as rod and cone cells, which play a really important role in, uh, in the uh, trapping of light and the, uh, essentially the, uh, the transmission of that light into a signal that our brain can recognize and can actually uh, realize as, as a vision or as a, an actual uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, essentially vision. Um, so how common are these mutations in the Boykin population? And I will say straight away that we don't know the specific mutation of, or the specific frequency of these mutations in the general Boykin population. And the reason we don't is it would require us to do a very random sampling of the population of a fairly large portion of the population to kind of get an idea of what's happening. But I do have our test results and we have to take these with a little bit of a grain of salt because we test a lot of very closely related dogs, which would cause us to be more likely to, um, to have some of the numbers skewed in some way. And in addition to that, if, if all is working well, we would expect to see far more carriers than at risk or affected dogs, because if people are using genetic testing to their advantage, we're not going to typically see a whole lot of at risk or affected dogs, because we're going to try to prevent that from happening. Um, and so in this particular case, you can see there's, there's a, a fairly high uh, number of carriers of, of these four diseases here um, in uh, that we see, uh, especially collie eye anomaly is very commonly seen in Boykin, but the others are, are very commonly seen as well. I will say interestingly though, um, you know, I did this uh, lecture about a month ago or something very similar to this, and I have these numbers from a month ago, and even within just the last month, um, these numbers of carriers that we're seeing are starting to come down a little bit. I don't know what that means. It could be very random, but it could also mean in some cases that people are, are you know, doing more uh, work to try to eliminate this from their lines, and we'll, it'll remain to be seen how this might change over the next couple of years or so as more and more people do this type of testing and use it to their advantage. 
So um, next we'll talk uh, a little bit about dominant diseases. We've covered our recessive diseases and dominant diseases, as I, as I kind of alluded to earlier, are, are diseases that only require one copy of the associated uh, genetic variant or mutation in order to either develop the disease or at least be in an increased risk of disease. And that is what's true in the case of IVDD is that it only takes one copy of that specific mutation in order to actually place a dog at an increased risk. And so when we uh, are looking at this, it's going to be a little different than what we were talking about in our recessive uh, case in, uh, cases. In this case here, we have a dog that still, again, only has one copy of the genetic mutation that's associated with disease. And in this case, it's marked as a D down here for dominant. And then we have a dog that doesn't have the mutation at all. But this dog would be considered at risk in a dominant uh, disease. And if we use our Punnett square here in the same way that we did previously, we'll find that if we were to breed a dog that's at risk for one of these diseases to a dog that's clear, then we get roughly about 50% of the dogs would be clear and roughly about 50% would be at risk. And uh, when it comes to IVDD, and we'll talk about this soon, this would be kind of the ideal situation in the dog that has one copy of, of the IVDD associated mutation. This would be kind of the ideal situation to start breeding away from it. Um, you'd end up with roughly about half your litter would be normal. And if you wanted to try to eliminate it, then um, you can definitely uh, keep one of these dogs in from the line there if, if you, uh, if you're looking to try to go move forward and then uh, use that as future breeding stock, that will really help uh, in that uh, progression toward getting clear. Um, so let's talk specifically here about IVDD and what's going on with this. Well, there are two known genetic mutations which play a role in dogs in shortened limbs. Um, and dogs that have incredibly short limbs, like the Dachshund, the Corgi, some of these dogs that are very, very, uh, have very pronounced shortening of the limbs, they tend to most commonly have two copies of both of these mutations. And that's what gives them that incredibly short appearance. One of these mutations, um, actually both of them, uh, of the mutations are caused by a section of a particular gene known as the FGF4 gene that's located normally on chromosome 18. And uh, this section of DNA has been duplicated and has been inserted into genes um, in, into what we refer to as aberrant locations in these, in these, two, or in these two other areas of chromosomes. So one of the uh, sections is actually, um, has been inserted into chromosome 12, and that is the specific genetic mutation which has been found to be associated with that increased risk of IBDD. The other uh, piece of DNA from chromosome 18 has actually been transplanted into a different location in chromosome 18. And that one also causes results in a shortening of limbs, but is not associated with an increased risk in, in the IVDD. Um, as I mentioned, uh, dogs that have the chromosome 12 mutation, or actually either of these mutations, will be expected to have shorter limbs uh, to some degree. Um, dogs that only have one copy of one of these mutations, quite commonly, they will not show, uh, show a, an extreme shortening of limbs. So some people that find that their dogs, that if they have one copy, they may not even really be able to notice all that much that they really have, have uh, a huge change. Um, but, uh, but anyway, uh, dogs with this mutation also then are, are, are believed to uh, have about a 5 to 15 times greater chance of developing this particular form of intervertebral disc disease known as type 1 intervertebral disc disease. And that's going to be compared to dogs that don't have the mutation at all. Um, we do not have great numbers for any specific breed at this point in terms of the likelihood that they're going to develop it if they have this mutation. And that would include the Boykin Spaniel as well. We don't have a great way to predict which dogs will or won't. Um, um, actually develop this. Dogs uh, inheriting the, the chromosome 18 mutation um, that's associated with the CDPA or chondrodysplasia, they will display shorter limbs, but they are not going to show any other health effects. And I just got a, another question from someone asking about the CDPA and, um, and if there's any adverse health effects associated with, with that. And there's not at this point, there's not any known uh, uh, issues related to that CDPA mutation. And that does lend us to, to uh, another really interesting thought that I'll get to here soon 
but the CDPA or the chromosome 18 mutation could actually be used to shorten the legs of dogs in situations where maybe the legs are too long. Um, and this is being done in some breeds right now where they're trying to eliminate the IVDD mutation, um, but they want to keep the legs short. The unfortunate part in the Boykin that, that I've up to this point is that I don't know that they actually inherit the CDPA mutation. I, uh, up to this point, I have not seen evidence of that. And so I think it's going to be very unlikely to be useful in the Boykin. Um, breeds like the miniature toy poodles, those breeds actually do carry this. And it is something that I talk with uh, breeders quite a bit about lately, about using that to their advantage if their dog's legs are getting too long when they eliminate the other mutation. I don't know that that's going to be a possible uh, uh, thing to do in Boykins. And so it's going to be a little bit more tricky. There are two specific types that we usually talk about, uh, sp two specific types of intervertebral disc disease that we usually talk about in dogs. And there's uh, first, uh, there's type two IVDD. And this is an age-related type of IVDD that we see in essentially any dog is potentially at risk for this as they age. Um, natural degeneration of those intervertebral discs can end up resulting in, in issues uh, related to that. Um, and uh, most commonly what we would see this in, it would be a dog that's greater than, than six years of age most commonly, and it can end up resulting in bulging or herniation of those intervertebral discs into the spinal cord. Um, this is very common in people as well. Um, many older people um, do develop some issues related to this where they have disc herniation. It's often referred to as a slip disc in people. Um, but dogs that have this type of IVDD, most commonly uh, would present with kind of acute flare-ups on a chronic disease. So these dogs may have a kind of a chronic ongoing issue, but every once in a while they may have kind of a flare-up where it ends up causing them really significant pain. They may have a little bit of a loss of function in some cases, um, or a, long, uh, a little bit of a loss of function over time in some cases. I actually had a dog that had this type of IVDD, and, and uh, over time she just kind of slowly started to develop some hind limb uh, abnormalities associated with that. Um, but in many cases, uh, dogs like this, you can often give them, uh, uh, in most of the dogs, you can, you can end up giving them some anti-inflammatory medications or pain medications, and uh, they will get themselves back to good, and then they may go a long period of time without having obvious clinical issues rela uh, related to this. Surgery can be, uh, can be indicated sometimes with these, but in, in many circumstances, uh, there, there's not. It's just simply medical management for them, and surgery may not be indicated nearly as strongly. Well, beyond the type 2 that we're talking about here that, that does seem to be more common in older age dogs, there's this situation here uh, with, oops, There's this situation here that's actually associated with this uh, chondrodystrophy mutation. And this is type 1 IBDD. And IBD, as I mentioned, type 1 is associated with this particular mutation, the chondrodystrophy. Um, and in these particular dogs, rather than it being a, a cause, old age being the, the biggest driver of the degeneration of those discs, dogs with this mutation actually begin that degeneration process at a very young age, usually before the age of 1. And what that ends up resulting in is these dogs do have something known as chondrodystrophy, which is essentially an abnormality in the way that the bones develop. Um, and it also ends up resulting in those intervertebral discs starting that degeneration process very early there. And it, it undergoes a process in which some of those cells are actually uh, replaced by other cell types and the discs also become calcified. And during that process, they become, uh, it results in some progressive weakness of the, uh, of the fibers in the disc and that can end up resulting in these herniations. Unfortunately, in dogs with this mutation that develop this type of IVDD, it tends to be much more severe when they have these, these uh, issues. Quite often, it'll be kind of an explosive herniation or explosive uh, extrusion of that disc into the spinal cord. And when that happens, it can often be associated by very severe pain. Uh, you can, uh, all, these dogs can also experience some bleeding and severe bruising of the spinal canal. Um, in those cases, uh, that, that can be much more likely to be uh, to have indications for surgery to try to repair it where they'll have to go in and actually remove that disc material and try to essentially what we say decompress the spinal cord because it's essentially an issue of compression uh, in, in many cases um, that also is contributing to this. And so to go in there and clean all of that out and, and remove that from the spinal cord can be really important. 
in some cases, unfortunately, the damage can be so severe that um, surgery is not going to be particularly helpful. And there are some assessments that, that neurologists can do to, to uh, give, get a better idea of prognosis. And it has a lot to do with what we refer to as deep pain or, or uh, recognizing pain in these dogs. And so, um, you know, this is uh, uh, something that would be uh, highly notated by, by the, um, the neurologist when they see them and, and uh, in order to make, uh, you know, the best decision for that particular dog. I created a little graph here to try to give an, an idea of what's happening. Um, as you can see here, dogs definitely have more vertebrae than this, but these little white boxes are, are representing vertebrae. And then I've got these little intervertebral discs here that are marked by these blue, um, these blue structures. And the intervertebral disc is essentially split into two main components. It's got this main component in the center known as the nucleus pulposus, which is essentially kind of a jelly-like uh, structure. We often refer to this as almost like a jelly donut that's lying here in between um, these vertebrae. And then we've got a uh, very tough outer fibrous layer known as the annulus fibrosis. And what happens in dogs with intervertebral disc disease is this middle section is what typically gets replaced by the other cell type and also becomes more and more calcified. And that applies uh, 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 or that ends up resulting in some significant forces being placed on this fiber, uh, fibrous layer here. And eventually at some point, uh, in some cases, we can actually have that fibrous layer rupture. And when that ruptures, it's going the, the place that most locally most commonly uh, ruptures into is the spinal cord, which is lying just adjacent to all of these discs. And so when this ruptures, it's going to hit that spinal cord and that's where you're going to get all of the problems, the associated problems that we see with this. Well, if we want to try to eliminate this, there are two major things that we have to consider. One of which is the potential loss of genetic diversity that we could face if we remove a huge number of dogs that have this mutation. And then secondly, we have to think about the breed standard leg length and, and meeting breed standard leg length. In some cases, there may be situations where we have to consider maybe a modification to the breed standard if we want to eliminate this. It, it all depends on the breed and all of the other uh, specific uh, information about it. First, in order to avoid the potential loss of genetic diversity, we have to kind of understand why it is that sometimes, why, why we say that gen, uh, genetic diversity is so important and what could potentially happen if we were to eliminate a large number of dogs. So here I've created this little graphic kind of showing on the left side here, the population before the introduction of, of a test like this IVDD test. And that, that, that's a way that we can think about it. This is a, a common type of graph or, or a picture here that's used to explain what we refer to as a genetic bottleneck. And genetic bottlenecks are, are a common cause of, of a loss of genetic diversity in a population. And the, the bottleneck can be caused by anything. It can be caused by a disease. It can be caused by anything that limits the population to some degree. And in this case, it could be a genetic test. And we've run a genetic test on all the dogs in the population and we find that all of these dogs here actually have the mutation. And so we say, uh, we're not gonna breed those dogs anymore. These dogs are done. Unfortunate part is, is by saying that essentially, uh, genetically speaking, that has the same effect of, uh, as it would if those dogs had actually died because they're not contributing their genetics to the population as a whole. And so what you'll see is that we, prior to, to doing the testing, we had all these different dogs represented by different colors, which I intended to show the, their uh, amount of genetic diversity they had, all of these different approaches. Well, if we were to eliminate all those dogs and just leave a little bit of the genetic diversity behind, those dogs are going to be responsible for repopulating the entire population going forward. So that means that on the other end of that, these dogs that, that are going to be presented on the other side are going to be much more similar similar to each other than they were previously. And that means that they're essentially more closely related than they would have been uh, previously. And unfortunately, when it comes to being more closely related, that can uh, also end up resulting in, in situations where uh, we actually have issues related to not only, um, you know, just the, the uh, increase in potentially other recessive diseases, because if you think about it, if these dogs are more closely related, not only are they going to be more likely to share the, the traits that we really want in our dogs that make them look like, say, a Boykin, but they're also more likely to share disease-associated mutations. And a recessive disease requires both parents to actually carry the mutation. And if they're more closely related, then that means they're more likely to share that 
same uh, recessive disease. Um, in the case of a disease that we could test for, we might be able to work around that, but most of the diseases we can't test for. And for that reason, you know, breeding any two random dogs from the population after a genetic bottleneck like this is going to increase our risk of other recessive diseases that we can't test for. And so, um, not only that, um, there are many other recessive diseases, but also it's been shown that dogs that are more closely related end up resulting in producing offspring that have a shortened lifespan compared to others and may actually decrease litter size as well. And so if we can do anything to avoid this, that would be ideal. And I do have some questions that are popping up here um, in the chat, and I will definitely be getting to them. Um, I'm, let me go through this part here um, to just kind of explain uh, a little bit more about this IVDD because I might answer some of these questions and then I'll kind of swing back to those and we'll talk about them a little bit further. So when we're talking about the Boykin Spaniel, the frequency um, yeah, of the mutation is fairly high. And on average, if we're looking at any given Boykin on average, each Boykin carries about one copy of the chromosome 12 mutation. And that's the one that is associated with the intervertebral disc disease. Some dogs won't carry any, some dogs will carry two copies. Um, it, it, it does depend on the individual, but as an average, um, it's, it's roughly about one per dog. As I mentioned earlier, in order to maintain our genetic diversity, we've got to be smart about how we do it. And I would recommend, and, and I think a lot of people are recommending at this point, the slow removal of this mutation, if we're going to remove it at all, uh, the slow removal over, over multiple generations. And there are several ways we could think about doing that. Probably the most ideal way to do that would be to breed dogs with the mutation to dogs that are clear. And in the case of a dog that has one copy of the mutation, as we mentioned earlier, about 50% of the puppies would be clear if that dog is bred to a clear dog. Um, and uh, that would give you about 50% of the litter. If a clear dog couldn't be found, and the only other dog that you had, if you had a carrier of one copy, a dog with one copy, then and you bred it to another dog that also had one copy, um, you would expect only about 25% of the pups would actually end up being clear. The remaining 75% would either have one or two copies. So you can see that's not a, exactly an ideal situation. Um, in the case of a dog that has two copies of the mutation, if bred to a clear dog, unfortunately you won't get any puppies that are completely clear, um, but they will all have one copy. And so um, if they have one copy of that mutation and then you breed one of those dogs to a clear dog, then you'll start getting some more clear dog. So it can take up to a couple of generations to really start eliminating this from your line, but it can be done. And this would be the preferential way to do it because we're not eliminating all of the other genetic diversity that these dogs have. And, and overall, for the sake of your breed, would be a much, much better approach at, at being able to eliminate this. So here we are again, kind of coming back to the Punnett square, and, and this is essentially the dominant Punnett square that we looked at earlier. Uh, if we have a dog with one copy of this, again, the most ideal situation would be to breed it to a dog that doesn't have it. And in that process, we would end up finding that about 50% would be clear or normal and 50% would be at an increased risk. As I mentioned here, again, this, uh, this would be the situation if we had two dogs that actually had the, uh, the mutation bred together, we would, uh, as I mentioned, we get about 75% of the dogs would actually still be at risk. 25% of them would have two copies, roughly about 50% would have one copy of it, and then about 25% would be normal. Um, the Probably the least desirable situation would be a situation where we're breeding a dog that has two copies. Um, you know, not that this couldn't be done and not that this is co completely incorrect or terrible to do, it's just that it, you're not going to get, within one generation, you're not going to get a clear dog. And that's uh, something that we have to account for. All 100% of the litter in this case would be carriers of it because the only thing that this dog can give is a mutated copy of the gene and the only thing this dog can give is a clear copy of the gene. And so for that reason, since each parent only gives one copy of the gene to each offspring, they will all work out to have one of each. And so that is why that, that's the case. So in addition to that, we have to think about leg length, not just the, the uh, genetic diversity loss potentially if we removed all these dogs, but then the leg length. And it is very possible that in some cases, the removal of that chromosome 12 mutation may end up being undesirable because of a length, uh, a leg length increase. And that could definitely uh, happen. As I mentioned, the chromosome 18 mutation could potentially be used in some breeds. 
Um, but right now, I, I don't have any information that suggests that Boykins actually have this mutation. In the future, maybe we will find this. Maybe we'll have some better information going forward. If they do have it, then those dogs might be really, really helpful because um, you could potentially breed those dogs into a line that you've already eliminated the IVDD mutation from and get those legs a little bit shorter again without that risk of disease. And so that, that potentially could be helpful. But again, I don't know how helpful that's going to be uh, in the Boykin. Um, there were definitely some questions related to, um, that I, that I received earlier today, uh, questioning about neuter status and whether neuter status might play a role in dogs developing IVDD. I will say we don't know for Boykins, but we do, we do have some evidence to suggest, at least in the dachshund, that, that early neuters may be, uh, uh, may result in an increased risk of IVDD, uh, as they age. And it's been found that dogs that are uh, neutered before 12 months of age do appear to have a higher risk of IVDD than dogs that are neutered after 12 months of age. I don't know if this is going to necessarily hold true for Boykins, um, but theoretically it could. Um, there are so many other genetic factors that play a role that in some breeds it may not, uh, but it, at least in the dachshunds it has shown to. In the dachshund study, this particular study here, uh, males were about 1.5% uh, or excuse me, a 1.5 times risk or 150% risk of uh, compared to dogs that uh, don't actually, uh, that didn't, or excuse me, that were, that were neutered before than after. Um, the, so the males that are neutered beforehand would have a 1.5 times greater risk. And then females would have about a two times greater risk or 2.1 times greater risk if they were neutered earlier or uh, spayed earlier than a year. And again, the lack of information, uh, there's really a lot of lack of information in other breeds, but at least in some breeds and perhaps even in most breeds, this might end up uh, being found to be true at some point. So people ask me all the time, what can I do to keep my dog, you know, or make my dog less likely to develop uh, IVDD? And unfortunately, there's not a lot of great answers to that. And you might get different answers depending on who you ask. But there are a couple of things that I think could be very reasonable to consider. One of which is to keep your dog an ideal body weight and not let them become obese. That's going to be huge. And um, I would even prefer to see a dog slightly, slightly more skinny than slightly overweight um, in that. Um, but in addition to that, exercise and muscle mass play a really important role in keeping the, uh, the spine uh, uh, in good health and in preventing the possibility of having these disc ruptures. And so I think that both of these are probably going to be the two that are very, very important in, in preventing dogs from having ruptures. Now, will, will anything completely prevent it? No, it's not going to. And there's a heavy genetic component here that's playing a role that is going to be very tough to overcome. Um, there is also some concerns potentially about dogs jumping up and down from high surfaces. And potentially with stairs, though I am a person that is not overly concerned about stairs because I, I just, unless your dog is the kind of dog that just goes gangbusters down the stairs without any, uh, any concern for <laughs> their safety, um, you know, the, the actually going up and down stairs probably would serve as a pretty good exercise for dogs in most cases, unless they're kind of crazy about it. Um, I would be a little bit more concerned about slippery stairs where dogs have the chance of maybe slipping off and, and tweaking their back in a way that, that could potentially put some unusual forces on their back. Um, but I'm not, uh, otherwise I'm, I'm personally not very scared of stairs. Um, I, I look at scares, stairs in most cases as a, an exercise for these dogs. And actually there was one uh, uh, study that was done and I will say it was, wasn't incredibly scientific because it was actually due to, uh, it was a survey of dog breeders and it was specifically dachshund breeders. And they actually found dogs that weren't allowed to climb stairs were actually at a greater risk of intervertebral disc disease, at least in the dachshund. And, um, you know, the, the assumption could be made there that perhaps the, the lack of uh, muscle development from avoiding those stairs would be, would be a, a potential uh, risk factor. And um, in some cases, it's actually been found too that dogs that are prevented from jumping up and down off of high surfaces are also potentially at, uh, at an increased risk of IVDD, uh, probably though just simply due to that muscle mass again. And I personally am not a big fan of allowing uh, these dogs to jump down from high surfaces if at all possible. I know that that's easier said than done. <laughs> dogs in my house, uh, have it's always been hard to keep them from jumping up and down from, from things like that. But I think that it's a reasonable uh, thing to do um, to, to try to help prevent that. 
Um, somebody had also sent in a question about a particular supplement uh, that, that potentially um, a high, high hyaluronic acid uh, supplement. I uh, don't have any strong evidence to suggest that, uh, uh, that I'm aware of that suggests that these supplements are very helpful with uh, preventing IVDD. Um, most of the studies that have been looking at some of these uh, have been mostly associated with uh, osteo, uh, osteoarthritis in dogs rather than IVDD um, in people as well. But I don't have any strong evidence to suggest that any of, or to, to think that any of these um, uh, supplements at this time are going to be very helpful for IVDD. So um, I wanted to uh, get to some of these questions here and we'll go back and I'll take a look here and see what we've got. Um, do, 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 do. So somebody asked about a dog um, being tested for CDPA as well as the CDDY, which all of our testing at paw print, and I think that most places now, when you do test for this IVDD associated mutation, which also goes by this name, chondrodystrophy, they usually also do the CDPA or chondrodysplasia. Uh, test along with that. And, um, and someone sent in a message here saying that they um, had a dog that came back with, uh, without the CDPA mutation, but had the actual CDDY or the IVDD mutation, had two copies of that. And they were asking what that means. And essentially that does mean that the dog is at risk for intervertebral disc disease. And they do probably have some shortening of the limbs associated with that mutation, the intervertebral disc disease associated mutation. But they don't have limb shortening associated with the other one, the CDPA. If the dog is clear of that, then that's not contributing to, to a leg length shortening. Um, and in either case, that particular mutation would not increase disease either, in either case. Um, and as I mentioned, I, I don't uh, think it's very, po very likely that, that uh, Boykins will actually carry that other uh, CDPA mutation. So um, that's not terribly uncommon for what we see here with these, these Boykins. But uh, dogs with two copies of the IVDD, they, at this point, we do not know for certain that they're at greater risk of IVDD than a dog that has only a single copy. Um, I, I understand that there's probably been some speculation about that uh, from some of the scientists that, that first looked at this, um, but I don't know that that has been proven at this point, and I don't, don't think that it has been. Um, uh, somebody sent in a, a message about a dog found to be affected or at risk and if there's anything that can be done to slow the progression. As I mentioned, you know, mostly the exercise and, and muscle development are going to be huge factors in that. At this point, I, I just wouldn't uh, uh, really feel confident enough to, to say that any particular supplements or endorse any particular supplements for this type of thing. Um, I, I just don't see anything up to this point that really has been very well proven. Uh, doo -doo -doo, let's see. Um, somebody had asked about since IVDD has incomplete penetrance, um, at what extent should breeders or purchasers consider whether uh, dogs closely related to a dog with that should they be bred? And as I mentioned, I, I think that that uh, breeding should be a consideration for these dogs if they're good good breeding candidates otherwise. Um, and you could definitely test, you know, if you needed to, you could definitely test the uh, genetics uh, of these dogs in order to, to know specifically what they've got going on there with, with the IVDD mutation. Um, but, but just the, the fact that a parent had this mutation alone may not be, you know, an, a significant enough reason to immediately remove them. So, um, uh, yeah, someone asked uh, about here too, um, that Boykins have always been a short-legged breed, yet the incidence of IVDD, at least anecdotally, seems to be more prevalent as of late. And, um, and should we be too cautious about focusing too narrowly on that mutation um, and, and focus on and, and need to consider the actual incidence and or tracing lines? And um, I suspect that probably IVDD has been an issue in Boykins for quite some time. Um, and this is true in a lot of different breeds. There's probably been, you know, risk factors in other breeds, but people, if they have a dog with a particular disease, especially if nobody else is talking about it, they don't talk about it very loudly. And so I think that this happens with a lot of different diseases where there may be something going on kind of smoldering and nobody talks about it too much. 
Um, in terms of focusing too heavily on CDDY, yeah, there, there is that concern. And that is exactly why I mentioned the loss of genetic diversity, because I think we need to take that into account and, and narrowing, you know, narrowing too, too heavily on CDDY could be very detrimental. And so not removing every dog with a mutation is, is kind of the balance, you know, the way to do that in a way that, that is still going to allow us to eliminate that. Um, eventually, we may find that there's other genetic mutations which also may contribute to this, and those might also be helpful later down the road. We just don't have them yet um, to really know. And uh, someone asked if, if uh, the CDPA mutation is not associated with IBDD, why do we test for it? And the only reason really that we test for it is the possibility of it being used to shorten the legs of the dogs if, if you want to eliminate the other mutation. And as I said, in the, the Boykin, that may not be particularly helpful, may not be, uh, give us what, what we want because they very well may not carry that mutation. Um, but in other breeds, it is very, very helpful um, to them. Uh, Oh, there was a, a question uh, that somebody had proposed about the age of, of testing and what, what age we should be testing these dogs. Really, technically, when it comes to genetic, genetic testing, any age is appropriate because those genetics are not going to change. And so quite commonly, people will do it early in life, especially before two years of age, you know, when they're kind of having their plans to breed these dogs. That's a very common time period is two years. So any time before that would be reasonable. Um, in terms of kind of the low end of things, I usually recommend that people at least wait until their dogs are about four to five weeks of age because at that point um, they're going to be more easily be uh, it's going to be easier to isolate them from mom um, we do recommend that that dogs are isolated from their litter mates and from mom uh, mom and dad for about an hour before swabbing them um, just to help eliminate any potential uh, contamination from mom's milk or from litter mates that they happen to be chewing on each other and around four or five weeks they're starting to wean already and so the stress level of both the puppies and the parents at this point or especially mom at this point is going to be a lot lower than it would be if we tried to do that a lot earlier. So um, oftentimes about four to five weeks is a great age. Um, what other questions out there? This is uh, this essentially is kind of the the end of what what I had uh, prepared here, but I want to be able to address people's individual questions as well. Um, I know there's probably a lot about IBDD. Um, it's such kind of a new finding that we have and there's still a lot of unanswered questions, but I'd be happy to address anything specifically. Uh, if, if you'd yeah, like. So Dr. Carl, I just wanted to kind of just reiterate and make sure because, you know, I get mm -hmm. asked the questions a lot. <laughs> sure, of course. Is one or two at this point, we, because it's a dominant gene, mm -hmm. there really isn't going to be, as far as we know, mm -hmm. much difference if, if your dog has one or two. Yeah, right now we don't we don't know that there's a difference. Um, as I said, there definitely has been some speculation that perhaps dogs that have two copies may be at a greater risk, and I think that it's reasonable to consider trying to limit the number of dogs that that have two copies of this mutation for that reason. But we don't have strong scientific evidence yet. But it wouldn't be shocking if that were the case. It definitely happens in other with other genetic mutations and other diseases. Um, but uh, right now we just don't have concrete evidence of that yet. So if we are Okay, so for the diversity of the breed, and because yeah. we have such a small gene pool in in the yeah. Boykin breed, um, let's say you have a, a a dog that's very titled, has mm -hmm. great field potential, mm -hmm. um, but it has two. Yeah, and would you recommend that we slow down on that breeding that dog? Not necessarily. I mean, I still think that that dog should be considered a dog that, that should be diversity. allowed for breeding. Yeah, exactly. I, I still think that the diversity should, should uh, be the top priority when it comes to this. It will take you one more generation to get to clear dogs, you know, if you really want to eliminate it from a dog that has two copies. But if this dog is a great dog otherwise, you know, uh, within a couple generations, you could get that bloodline back to being free of that specific mutation and still retain all those other great traits that that dog has. So it, you know, is it ideal? Well, well, it's not ideal, but you know, doing nothing is definitely not ideal, right? Like <laughs> in, in the grand scheme of things. So um, I, I think that it's very reasonable to keep those dogs in, especially at this early uh, place that we are with this, you know, give us five years from now. And, and if people really uh, crack down on this and decide that this is the direction that you want to take the breed, I, I think that there's going to be major changes uh, for the breed within a, a pretty short period of time um, if, if we, you know, do this well. Right. And I, and I think, you know, this is a start educating 
only, you know, the breeders know their, their game, but also mm -hmm. for us as the owners knowing what questions to ask yeah. so that we we are you know a little more educated as to what may happen and what we need to do um like i personally don't let my dogs jump out of my jacked up jeep anymore yeah, yeah. <laughs> i learned the hard way yeah. <laughs> that's a high surface <laughs> right yeah and particularly so in dogs that otherwise don't get any exercise right like if you just have a dog that's kind of a couch potato and then you put them in your car you know your high truck or your high car and then allow them to jump out they theoretically would be, you know, at a greater risk of potentially having something right. happen. And that, just to tell everybody that, that my dog is the quintessential model for that. He yeah. is potato. He's the shorter legs, stockier build. So he was a little more heavy set. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say he was obese, but he's much more of a stockier, stockier build. And he has two copies of the chromosome and, and he jumped out of a Jeep. So, yeah. you know, wrap all the factors together it was just the unfortunately the perfect mix yeah and it definitely can be and and this is a you know this is as i mentioned uh, you alone as boykin breeders or boykin owners you know uh, you're 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 not alone in in the concern about this disorder um you know this was this mutation was selected for over many 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 generations in a wide variety of breeds because people really liked that short-legged appearance and we didn't know that it was associated with this disease until just recently. And, and so it is going to take a lot of time for breeds to kind of come to terms with this and to move the direction they want to move. And as I said, some breeds are going to have very difficult decisions to make because breeds like the Dachshund or the Corgi, they're going to have to consider outbreeding to really get, uh, get rid of this. Um, there's just not going to be able to, uh, to eliminate this, you know, if they stay within their own breed. So these kind of things are going to be tough conversations that are going to have to be had. Um, right. And, to and it was just recently that we, you guys found this out because this is the testing only been around for what a year yeah it hasn't been out too long uc davis uh, did all the groundwork they found the mutation and and have done all of the, the you know the the groundwork and the the studies associated with this and i know that they're still doing a lot of research as well but they published all this information and it's probably been about a year year and a half now i think um i can't remember the specific date um and so it's it's caused a lot of you know a lot of concern obviously in in people but the beauty is is that now we have this information and and i would urge people to not you know uh be be uh, cautious, but not overly concerned. You know, I think that this is something that we need to use to our advantage. We've got this great tool to be able to use and, and uh, eventually eliminate suffering or at least greatly reduce suffering in a large number of dogs, which to me as, as somebody, as a veterinarian working in this, this is the beauty of genetics is I get to prevent disease before it ever even happens, or at least decrease the incidence of disease before it ever even happens. And, and uh, ideally that's, that's going to be the way medicine works going forward is that we can do as much as possible to prevent things rather than waiting until something arises to fix it. And that's why I think that, that the beauty of our community now, um, you know, getting the word out just so that you know, we're not here to create a panic. We're just here to create the education about it so that we can continue to enjoy this breed. And, you know, those of us that, that are, I call the IVDD survivors, um, you know, can spread the word too that timeliness with an injury is very important, which hopefully we will have another, another webinar to discuss all of that to try and save these dogs. Yeah, so absolutely. Have an injury, um, absolutely. you know, difference between the, the the DM we share on there too, the difference between the DM and the IVDD, because some of the stuff is yeah. very similar. It's very similar. In fact, I can go into that a little bit. I'm sure that's a, okay. of interest to some people, but um, DM is, is, is definitely one of the rule outs that we would think about. Now, the major differences between DM and IVDD, if you were to see a dog, first of all, DM tends to be much more chronic and slowly progressing. So you wouldn't expect a dog to be normal one morning and the next morning wake up and the dog doesn't want to move. So that, that's a major change. The other difference is, is that DM is not associated with pain. It is associated with neurological weakness, paralysis, um, um, or, or what we call paresis, which is essentially just weakness. Um, but it is not associated typically with pain. Usually pain in those dogs is associated with something else. And so that is a major, major contributing factor. Dogs that have IVDD, they're painful. They're going to hurt. And, and that's a major factor. Um, but it, it was very common for me in clinical practice to see an older dog, especially with the other type of IVDD. And people would bring their older dog in and say, I think my dog's got DM. 
come to find out it actually was just this type two intervertebral disc disease, this kind of slow smoldering thing that they had going on there. And it is very common to see in older dogs, but again, this type with associated with this mutation is very different in terms of its age of onset and severity. So. Um, it looks like one person had asked um, here the actual increase in risk of IVDD when, when you have this mutation and then what is the percentage of Boykins with IVDD. We don't really have great numbers on that. We know that at least it, it's believed that about five, uh, somewhere between five and 15 times uh, risk uh, or increase in risk with the mutation. And I think that's been uh, uh, I don't, I don't know exactly how they got those numbers to be quite frank with you um, because, um, but I know that it's been studied in, in a, quite a few uh, uh, different breeds now at UC Davis and, and this was their estimates that they had given or approximations as to how much it may increase it. Um, so uh, someone asked kind of a, a related but unrelated question about coefficient of inbreeding and um, what sort of coefficient of inbreeding would be recommended for a breed with, with limited diversity like a Boykin. And there's no easy answer to that, um, but kind of the general ground rules that I've seen, and it was, it was previously um, kind of discussed at the uh, Institute for Canine Biology, um, that somewhere between five and 10% is often kind of the, the uh, thing that is tried to, that, that people try to aim for in terms of coefficient of inbreeding. Um, and the way that I think about it is that first cousins are about 6.25%. So that is about as close as you'd ever want to go. Um, the, the discussion is, is that if you breed dogs together that are under 5% coefficient of inbreeding, you may have a more challenging time retaining some of the traits that you're really trying to keep in your line. Whereas you're getting start, start getting over 10 percent, you're going to be increasing the likelihood of recessive diseases. And what that percent means is the percentage chance that if you look at any particular location in the genome, that they have the exact same uh, genetic, uh, genetic makeup from both parents. So if you have a situation, obviously you can see that why that would be a major concern with recessive diseases, because you have to have two copies of those mutations, one from each parent in order to develop the disease. So at the higher percentage chance that, that if you looked at any location in the genome, they would have the exact same genetics there. That's going to increase the potential risk. If that particular location or that particular region happens to be a region that's associated with disease, then potentially you would increase that risk. You know, there is no truly 100% safe way to breed dogs in terms of the coefficient of inbreeding because the ideal coefficient of inbreeding, if you wanted to get, you know, eliminate or prevent recessive disease would be zero, but that's not practical and that's not useful for a breed. So we have to have some huge component of it there that, that makes the breed the breed or some component of it that makes the breed the breed, which is why they give that five to 10% buffer there. Um, is, is uh, in that. And coefficient of breeding is not always easy um, to calculate. Um, there are some genetic ways to do it now. I believe they're actually doing some of that at UC Davis as well. And it's something that we're very interested in and are investigating uh, as well about looking at uh, what we refer to as regions of homozygosity, which are essentially regions of the genome that are identical uh, um, from both parent. And those, those regions potentially could be regions where recessive diseases could, could exist. And there are some calculations that can be done by testing dogs to know which mate might be a better mate for a dog based upon those regions in the genome. And UC Davis is starting to do that work now in very specific breeds. And I don't know that Boykin is a part of that, but I know that they're doing a lot in poodles and other breeds looking at this. And it's something that we're very interested in. I think it's going to become a very important part of breeding going forward that people would typically have their dogs uh, tested for this particular test and then make breeding decisions, uh, not only just the specific specific mutations for disease, but also to decrease the overall uh, coefficient of inbreeding and potentially make their dogs more healthy. Wonderful. Do we have any other questions? I know it's a, I know it's a lot and some of it might have been right over our heads, but it was very important, I felt, that in order to really look at all of this, we have to kind of go from one end to the other. And the genetic testing, of course, is, in my opinion, the beginning so that we can know how we can look for it. And then the, how we deal with the injuries and, and things like that would be the second part of it. Sure. Um, so I'm hoping that everybody kind of got most of their questions answered. You know, unfortunately, like he said, at this point, because the test is so new, and we don't have as much data. Um, 
you know, we need to, I need to encourage you to test your dogs um, just so they have the data. If nothing else, the more data that they have, the more we can get these percentages and numbers together. And whether you do it at Paw Prints, which we, we love Paw Prints, or at UC Davis, either one, um, even if your dog is not showing any signs, having that data is going to be worth getting it through. So if you, you know, if you can find when there's a sale on at Paw Prints, they have sales all the time. Um, the other thing you can do, if you haven't tested your dog for anything, Paw Prints now has the caninehealthcheck.com. And their comprehensive test also includes the IVDD test. Um, and it's at a very reasonable price. So thank you for, for you guys doing that. But that, yeah. that really good way, if you've not tested your dog at all, to, to get a good baseline for being a prepared parent. Okay, let's, you know, let's be a prepared parent. Absolutely. And um, I have my uh, contact information here as well. You're very welcome to either email me, even pick up the phone and give us a call during business hours. Um, feel free to uh, find me on Facebook there. Send me a friend request. This is my work Facebook page. And so I do send out things about what's going on and at Paw Print from time to time on there. Um, I'm not going to hit you up with a bunch of spam or anything like that, but I will occasionally put on my own uh, news feed some, some things. Um, and, uh, it, but if you are uh, looking to get a hold of me, probably the best way is via email. I don't, uh, check my Facebook nearly as often as I check my email. So uh, you're definitely welcome to give me a call and answer any questions that, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have at any time, especially if I fumbled my words today or anything else, uh, I, I'd be happy to help you. Great. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Um, if not, like you said, um, we will have this available to you so you can go back to it um, and write down any information that you need or if you have any more questions. Um, so please get your dogs tested. Please get pet insurance. I can't stress that enough. If you know, it may not even help to the beginning, but it will help reimburse you if there's anything like an EIC episode, if your dog eats a sock, um, or if you have the unfortunate of a herniated disc. Um, my, my personal plea is please, please. There's so many companies out there now that are doing pet insurance. And with paw print genetics offering all of this testing at a reasonable price and all the, all the um, different BOGO sales they have, it's, it's phenomenal. It's, it's worth it for you to be prepared and, and know what may, may come down the pike. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Teresa. And I think the other important thing too to consider is if you are going to consider insurance, you may want to consider it very early in your dog's life because if for some reason, uh, you know, you do this testing, uh, I, the unfortunate thing is, is that I think insurance companies eventually are probably going to start using genetic testing potentially to identify pre-existing conditions, which is very sad to me, but I think it's a reality. And so if you can get your dog on an insurance prior to that doing the genetic testing, as weird as that sounds, I think that that's probably a very, uh, a very reasonable thing to do to to protect yourself it is. so we did have one question come in they want to know where you got that hat <laughs> uh, this is uh, I actually I love hats I've loved hats since I was a very young kid and this is a company called Gorn Brothers that is very popular and so that's that's uh, Gorn Brothers is the place to go I, I, I need to reach that's, out to them for a sponsorship if I'm going to be doing yeah that. that's pretty awesome you know we're all used to baseball hunting caps <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty uh, awesome well, well we cannot we cannot thank you enough um, my pleasure. this was phenomenal and um, again, everybody, if, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to him please or do. reach out to me. Check out our IVDD Boykin Spaniel uh, Facebook page. Also, please like Southern Boykin Spaniel Club. Um, we, we not just in Florida. If you want to come on down and join us, our next event is going to be November 14th. Uh, we are now in phase three here in Florida. So uh, we will still you know, try to be safe with our, with our event, but um, we are going to have it because we, doggone it, we miss seeing everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so. best of luck to everyone. Again, yeah, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm very happy to, to talk with you, whether on the phone or via email. I do it every single day. I really love it. Um, and I'm just uh, looking forward to help you guys, uh, you know, pursue what you need to to get the best dogs you can. So uh, please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. And everybody, if you enjoyed this, please share it on your page that it was a, a great presentation. Um, like I said, we're going to try and do another one, hopefully with a neurologist next time that will be able to answer a lot more questions about 
um, the types of injuries that they're seeing now with the Boykins and what you can do. So thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. Have a great night. And thank you, Dr. Carl. Thank you, guys. Take care. Good to see you. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye.